Do you have that one friend filled with that random and seemingly unending amount of useless knowledge? Well, I am that friend, and if I don't know the answer to something, I'll certainly be looking it up. I love to learn, research, and share my findings, so I thought, why not share it all with a bunch of strangers on the internet? And, you know, maybe enjoy a drink or two while we're at it. Welcome to I'm Already Looking It Up. All right. Hello, hello, and welcome to a brand new podcast. This is the very first episode uh, called I'm Already Looking It Up, a podcast where I have a drink or two and we talk about random stuff that I like to look up. Um, So my name is Carly and I will be the host of this podcast. Um, I don't have any other hosts, it's just me. But we're just gonna, you know, see how see how this goes and try to have a little fun with it. Um, I do want to say right at the beginning of everything, this uh, may have explicit content at times. So if, you know, you have uh, little ones listening and you don't want them to hear about certain topics and things, um, I would, you know, just proceed with caution. Um, but I will try to give a warning if there is an episode that I think is particularly explicit or maybe upsetting. So there is that. And also I want to put it out there that um, some of these topics are going to be very well researched. And then some of these topics are going to be, you know, things that kind of just pulled off the Internet, maybe from Wikipedia. No, Wikipedia is not the best source, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, kind of cross that bridge when we come to it um and again and i'll i'll try to remember to um remind y'all when that's a thing so today's topic since it is uh my birthday when this is going to be um put out i decided i wanted to start off this podcast with something that's very relevant to me but also um, kind of fitting for the season in which it is Halloween, and um, I love Halloween. I'm so excited uh, to share some of this stuff with you guys and just kind of chill out and talk about some stuff. So the very first topic we're going to talk about is um, some ghost stories and other spooky stories that revolve or take place in um, Kansas, because Kansas is where I am from. So I have a few stories here that I think um, will be pretty fun to kind of talk about and just explore and maybe laugh about a little bit. Um, And I... Once again, this is something I didn't like. Do a heavily amount of research into it. Some it's a topic I would I would maybe like to revisit in a future episode because I feel like there's more to some of these stories than the simple websites uh, were telling me. But you know what? I decided I was gonna do this podcast for sure like a couple weeks ago, so I didn't have a ton of time to research. I mean, I do have a full time job. Um and everything so I didn't I did the very bare minimum here but I think these are fun um and they're very interesting and some of them are things I'd never really heard of so um I definitely think this will be a fun time so the very first spooky Kansas story we're going to talk about is Stoll, Kansas. Now, I don't know if anyone has ever heard of this um, or anyone out there listening has ever heard of this, uh, but it's a town in Kansas. Uh, Right now, it has, I think, a population of probably less than like 50 people, but it's a, a town that some people think houses the gateway to hell, which um, it's actually kind of funny to think about this uh, story a lot because um, it's been featured on a couple of things in pop culture. It's been on Supernatural, uh, specifically in the episode Swan Song. Um, I have probably seen that episode. I don't remember it if I do. 
uh, if I have. Sorry, my bad. So, um, it's been in that episode. I believe it's an episode where Satan faces off against Lucifer. Something along those lines. I'm probably wrong. Comment if I am. Also, if you hear my cat meowing in the background, I am so sorry. Um, that's Hobbs. Uh, all right. And then it's also been in Turbulence 3. Uh, heavy metal. Never seen that before. And a movie called Nothing Left to Fear. I'm sure it's been mentioned in some other things. But those are the three I found. Um, it's really an interesting little story. So, uh, let's get right into it. Um, so this story... Let's see. The community of Stoll is in Douglas County, Kansas. Uh, it was founded in 1857, initially known as Deer Creek, and then it was renamed after its only postmaster, uh, Sylvester Stoll. As of 2018, only a handful of structures remain. So... Kansas has a lot of little towns like these where, you know, if you're not from Kansas, you wouldn't know this. Probably a lot of people listening are from Kansas because probably family and friends and, and stuff. But, um, so Kansas have a lot of little towns like this that uh, don't have a big population or don't have a population at all, but they are still just kind of there. Um, of course, I mean, old abandoned creepy buildings are going to be old abandoned and creepy. So a lot of things can happen there. Now, when it comes to ghosts, I am a personal believer. I'm not really a skeptic. Um, though my idea of what a ghost is, um, it's, it, you know, there's there's a lot of interpretations. I, I like to think that these are um, people who have passed on. And um, a lot of the time I feel like ghosts are uh, people who still have have something left in this world that they need to do, or that some just you know um, unfinished business, as they say. Uh, but I also think that it's mostly energy, right? It, it's mostly this feeling, this vibe that ghosts leave behind. Not to sound like a millennial, but I am a millennial, so I guess I will sound like one. Um, it, it's a vibe that they leave behind. Um, and I think there are a lot of places where it may be stronger, it may be weaker, but you, you feel it. And whether you see something, you know, or you hear something, it's all circumstantial. You're never going to, I don't think we're ever going to have an answer to whether or not ghosts are actually real in the way that most people think of ghosts. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, it, it's worth having something to believe in. So, um. Anyway, back to back to Stoll, Kansas. I uh, so I looked into some of the <laughs> stories that exist about this uh, little town in Kansas. I even when I read about this, because I actually initially read um, uh, this story in a book that my mother-in-law actually got for me a couple Christmases ago, called "Interesting Stories for Curious People." I don't think so. Get down. Um, sorry, my cat was trying to eat my food. Interesting stories for curious people. Um, and it's by Bill O'Neill. And uh, a collection of fascinating stories about history, science, pop culture, and just about anything else you can think of. Uh, this is like a, the perfect book for me because I love, like I said before, learning <laughs> these random crazy things that are just you know, so odd and so, like, just hidden in history. So this is where I first learned about this. Um, I'm probably going to end up pulling a lot of stories from this book. But Stoll, Kansas, in here, they talk a little bit about it. Um, and you know what? I'm going to go ahead and read the story because it's pretty short. Uh, but it's a very, it's very interesting. So, <clears throat> If you're ever passing through Kansas City and are up for a potentially frightening detour, you might be interested in driving just seven miles of Lawrence, Kansas, to the tiny town of Stoll, Kansas. The area around Stoll was settled by German immigrants, and in the mid-1800s, the people built a church and a cemetery, making those the centerpiece of what would become the unincorporated town of Stoll. 
Despite its potential, Stoll never grew beyond 50 people and is all but abandoned today. Some say the town was just a victim of the times, as Americans flocked to suburbia after World War II. Towns like Stoll had nothing to offer. But there are those who believe something more sinister was behind Stoll's demise. A couple of tragic deaths in Stoll left a major impression in the minds of people in that area. First, there was a boy who was burned to death when his father set fire to his land to clear away some brush. The other involved the mysterious death of a young man who had gone missing. He was found a few days later hanging from a tree. Some say he committed suicide, while others believe he was murdered. Then there was the town church and cemetery, which people began calling one of the seven gateways into hell in the 1970s. The origins of the legend are unclear. The first documented mention of the haunted church and cemetery appeared in a 1974 issue of the University of Kansas student newspaper, the University, the University Daily Kansan. <clears throat> Some of the details of the legend were outlined in the article. For example, on both Halloween and the spring equinox, a set of otherwise hidden steps appears near the church that leads to the deepest bowels of hell. There is no evidence that such a legend existed before the article was published, which would make sense because the church had already been closed for some time, and there had yet to be any tales of supernatural occurrences associated with the church or the cemetery. By 1974, uh, sorry, but 1974 was just on the heels of the counterculture movement, which included a plethora of New Age religious groups and more than a few cults. By the early 1970s, self-appointed psychics, ghost hunters, and self-proclaimed Satanists began visiting the town on a regular basis. This led to the Daily Kansan article, which consequently popularized, popularized the story. By the late 1970s, Stoll had become a popular destination for local high school and college kids looking for a little excitement. The cemetery became littered with beer cans, some of the tombstones were vandalized, and the church was regularly used as a party pad, which is very unfortunate. After all this was happening, ah, sorry. As all of this was happening, strange events continued. Chilling sounds were heard, scary apparitions were seen, and many reported having car problems near the church and cemetery. It all became too much for the Douglas County officials, who had the church demolished in 2002, and now regularly patrol the cemetery, especially on Halloween and the spring equinox. Despite all the strange occurrences associated with Stoll, there are no confirmed reports that anyone ever took the steps into hell, at least if someone did, and if they survived, they never said anything about it. So that's the, uh, the, official, that's the official story of Stoll, Kansas. Now, I, this, this place is only about, like, two hours-ish away from me. And I really kind of want to go see it. But I, I did find some extra stuff about the um, town itself and kind of what that cemetery looks like today. So, according to legend, kind of as the uh, book mentioned, uh, in 1974 an article came out. It said, you know, there's the demons afoot. No, it's not what it said. I don't know what it said. I actually probably should have looked up this Kansan, this uh, University of Kansan article. Would have been cool to read. Um, I'm sure it exists. I'm sure I can find it somewhere. Um, however, people believe it goes back hundreds of years. Um, as far as like supernatural uh, sightings and everything that have occurred. Um... Several strange occurrences uh, in the Stoll churchyard. Some of these tales and legends asserted that the churchyard and cemetery was one of the places on earth where the devil appears in person. So, this story about Stoll is super interesting because there, there's really nothing to corroborate these findings, these these legends. Even the townspeople themselves uh, 
say that, that they don't know where these stories came from. And a lot of the time, like uh, in Stoll particularly, it's it's basically reported that the people who do still live there are like um, people who uh, were related to those who founded the, the town. So like if anyone is to know about any stories or anything, it would be those people. And for the most part, they usually pretty much say that the, you, there's nothing going on here. You, y'all are crazy. Like, move on. Um, and they've been annoyed by the fact that this has become so popular because of the vandalism that the book mentioned, which is so sad. Don't don't go out and vandalize historic places. It, it's not cool. Don't use them as part. I know this was in the 70s and stuff, so maybe it doesn't happen as often anymore. But, it, you know, don't. This is how buildings get ruined, and uh, then we don't have records or research. And as someone who, um, you know, studied the art of research and even has. I have a master's in, in history, um, I, you know, I, I very much enjoy having actual history to go back to rather than just guessing, which is a lot of what a history is sometimes. It's unfortunate um, because a lot of what the craft of the historian has to be is is solid evidence. And um, yeah, so very, you know, please don't, don't do that. Don't, just don't. Um, anyway, so uh, the the townspeople, the people who owned the property that the cemetery and the church were on, they they didn't like that people would come and try to uh, party, essentially on um, their uh, on the churchyard or in the church in general because it's an old building. I mean, it can't handle teenage parties. Um, and as I said uh, before, the the church. And, well, I'm not so certain about the graveyard. I believe this is also true of the graveyard. But the church and the graveyard actually don't, like, by the time these rumors circulated and, and the history and lore of Stoll uh, started to um, become more popular and people would go visit it, uh, the church um, was no longer in operation. In fact, it was already falling apart because it was so old. They'd already actually built a new church. So... That's interesting. And um, I don't I believe they didn't use the graveyard at that point as well. So really, like there really was nothing to kind of say that these stories were in any way factual. However, I do want to point out that the that I do believe and I could be wrong. So if anybody listening knows more, please feel free to correct me. Um, I know with that. The internet is not always the most solid source of information. And you know what? People make up things and write things in books all the time. So um, you never know what's actually true until you really do your research. And like I said, some of this research is done really well. Some of it is just, hey, I found this article on the internet and I thought it was interesting, so I'm going to tell you about it. Um, most of the time I will try to do as much research as I can, but, you know, time limits I have like I said, full-time job, all that. So, anyway. So, uh, the story about the boy who died in the fire is most likely true. I think I, I did read that in an article that, that, that what, that's one of the deaths that is probably true. Whereas, um, the one about the boy, or the one about the stranger who came into town and, you know, uh, either was murdered or... Or um, he either, you know, committed suicide, unfortunately. He, uh, as far as we know, we don't know if that's true or not. So, because it would have been a stranger, a nameless. Um, but I believe the original graveyard does have a tombstone for the boy who died in the fire. Again, don't quote me on that. Could I absolutely be wrong? Feel free to correct me. I will not be offended. But um, that is just what I have read. So... Uh, it's a very interesting case. Um, like I said, many of the legends and stories, uh, don't really have any proof or any backup or corroboration. Um, uh, several historians, reporters have investigated these claims and none of them seem to be true. 
Uh, there do not seem to be records indicating that any of this is true, aside from a few old, odd last names on some of the tombstones and mysterious landmarks on the site. Uh, not even the residents of Stoll, like I said, the few that do still live there claim or believe any of this is true. In fact, they are pretty annoyed by the, these happenings. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, there is, there is a bit of an interesting little legend about Stoll that I did find. So, uh, while the stories may not be completely true or may have already been disproven or debunked, um, there is something undoubtedly odd about, about the cemetery and the church. Um, the property owners, of course, have spoken out against vandals and legends. They reportedly have done, ah, sorry, though the property owners have spoken out against vandals and have spoken out against the legends, they have done very little to end this whole, like, going to stole especially on halloween which of course people are gonna go on halloween um and you know seeing if the devil is gonna come out of, of the ground basically um so uh basically like now as far as i read and i believe the story in the book said it uh now they are um sorry <laughs> Now they are, uh, they have gates, or not gates, fences up around the cemetery. The church is not there anymore, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, they have gates up around the cemetery. They do have police officers who do patrol um, the, uh, you know, uh, the fences, I'm sorry, and um, everything in Stoll. Though I don't, I don't quite understand how that works i don't know if it's like just on halloween that they patrol it or what however if you do decide to go to the cemetery and you do get caught trespassing you will be fined a thousand dollars so i was a college student not that long ago i don't have a thousand dollars to spare so i don't think many people do have a thousand dollars to spare so i wouldn't quite that's maybe not not the best idea so uh i do think that's very odd though like if they know that the legends and all that stuff are true i mean obviously they don't want you know vandalism to happen so that's probably a big reason of putting up the fence and everything however there is one one thing that's maybe just a bit fishy about stole which is um so they'll often chase people off the property when they come to visit on halloween night Though they typically won't do so until 11.30 p.m. Even when they ask the police officers to be there at the property. See, I find that very interesting because if you're going to ask the police to be there anyway, which in the report I read, they do typically have them there for up until that like 11.30 mark when they tell everyone to, you know, get, get going, get gone. And, um... I think that's very interesting that they uh, don't really, like, ask anyone to leave before then. It's at 11.30. Um, on March 29th of 2002, the church from legend was mysteriously demolished. The, the people who own the property claim that they didn't make any plans to do so, and even the townsfolk had no idea that it happened. Yet the legend continues and the stories continue to spread. So, so Stoll is kind of interesting um, in that, you know, maybe, maybe it's not exactly what we think is going on there. Maybe there's not spirits rising from the grave or apparitions appearing, but maybe there's something a little, a little odd. Um, but yeah, that's, that's Stoll, Kansas. I enjoyed researching that so much because it was something that when I <laughs> looked it up, everyone was like, oh, it's the gateway to hell, and it's so scary and spooky. And then, like, it came down to, oh, it's actually probably all not true. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a lot of fun. <clears throat> all right, so my next story, and one of my favorites, because I first learned about the story on um unsolved supernatural i was very i am absolutely obsessed 
with uh, Ryan and Shane on um, the Unsolved shows. So um, it actually, I, I was excited when uh, I thought of the idea to do like Spooky Kansas because I was like, oh, I can talk about like the Sally House and Atchison, um, which my mom also mentioned to me. Hi, mom. She's probably listening. I hope. Um, <laughs> And, um, she mentioned, uh, Atchison and how it's kind of spooky and creepy. So I, I was excited. I was like, oh, I can talk about the Sally House. So the Sally House is probably one of the more well-known, um, haunted houses in America. Uh, it's a pretty interesting, uh, haunted house because it does seem fairly modern, pretty normal. Um, the Sally House, people say, is infested by a demon, or at least, um, Ryan believes that on BuzzFeed, I'm sorry, BuzzFeed Unsolved Supernatural. They actually don't do that show anymore, I should say. They, they do Watcher, which is their own channel on YouTube. If you've never heard of them, uh, you should really check them out. They're hilarious. Uh, they don't just do ghost stories and stuff. They do a lot of other things, um... I've watched uh, several of their, like, playlists. I, my, one of my favorites is The Professor, um, <laughs> who does um, puppet history. And that, I love that one. But I'm a history, like, I'm a big history person. So, and, and it's kind of the same like this. They talk about a lot of random things that happen. So, um, definitely go check them out. I'm sure they don't need a shout out from me, as they're a pretty big channel on their own. But, uh, you know. I'd love to shout out my favorite things. So, um, so the Sally House, uh, Ryan on and Shane on uh, BuzzFeed Unsolved. They have done this house a couple of times. They've done investigations there. I <laughs> so like I said, I do believe in ghosts. I do believe in energies. I believe that something can have a good vibe and a bad vibe. However, I have watched the Sally House episodes like several times. Like so many times because my YouTube algorithm just replays the same stuff over and over and it's really frustrating, but I've watched the Sally House episodes a lot and, uh, I don't know, I, I, I think the Sally House doesn't seem that scary to me, but even though I live in Kansas, I have never actually been there, so I don't know, I, I don't know the, like, what the energy feels like and how it, it, you know, well, I don't know what it's like. So I can't, you know, sit here and say Ryan's a big crybaby. But I can. No, I'm kidding, Ryan. I, I think, it, like, he's listening. I think, um, it, you know, there everyone has kind of their own temper, interpretations. Sometimes they get in their own heads. Sometimes things are actually happening and there's just no way to explain it. So it can be, uh, you know, however you interpret it. Uh, but when I've seen the episodes... Personally, it doesn't seem that scary to me, but I've also never been there, so I can't say. Uh, so the Sally House is an interesting little story as well. Um, it's also another uh, big legend in Kansas that I feel like doesn't really have a lot of uh, backup evidence behind it, which I mean, these are ghost stories. I, there's not a ton of evidence per se um that historically speaking we can necessarily corroborate i did try to look into the backgrounds of some of these legends you know um and just see were there any i even look tried to look up uh sally in atchison kansas and yeah so let's uh let's just kind of move on to the story here uh, so the Sally House, uh, it sits currently unoccupied. Um, it's available for day tours and overnight stays. And you have to sign a waiver due to potential for injury if you visit. So um, the house was built at the turn of the century and occupied by Dr. Charles Finney and the Finney family. He practiced medicine within the home, using the bottom floor as an examination and surgery room while living upstairs. The family moved out due to the lack of space. So I also learned a couple things, which I think I wrote here in my notes. Yeah, so there are a couple of uh, more, some interesting things going on in this house. So the Finney family um, wasn't just Dr. Charles Finney and his wife, um, and any children they may have had, it didn't really mention that, but it was also, like, 
Dr. Finney's father. And then next door, there was apparently a house that was uh, built by Dr. Finney's brother. And, uh, you know, some things happened there as well. So um, don't think of this as just like one person. You know, one, you know, two people lived here once. It was it's a family of people. Dr. Finney just occupied the space as more of a home doctor's office um, than uh, a, just a home. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, so as the story goes, the house is haunted by a young girl who died during a surgical procedure. She had been brought to the house for severe abdominal pain, and Dr. Finney believed that she had appendicitis and needed emergency surgery. Um, apparently, he cut into her before um, anesthesia kicked in or took effect, and she died on the operating table screaming in pain. Um, so it, it said that this is Sally. This is who haunts this home. Um, and most likely others. So, uh, it's very interesting to think about, uh, who, who is Sally? Who is this girl? Why are there no records of her? What, you know, what really happened that day at the Sally house? If, if it happened at all. So, um, I, I looked into this a little deeper to see, you know, if I could find records, I love looking at records. I think records are absolutely fascinating and everything. So I did look into this a little more. And I found that the Sally house, um, there are two stories behind Sally and her appendicitis. One is the first story that I sort of just read where she, her mother showed up and the anesthesia didn't kick in in time and she died. Um, which is very sad. I mean, uh, we all know, I mean, I think most of us know that medical history is very gruesome and very sad to look into. It's also fascinating. And I'm, you know, I'm born around Halloween. I'm really into morbid stuff. Um, I like learning about that stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it, it was not a great time for medicine and, of course, anesthesia probably didn't work as fast as it does now because I know, like, I just had surgery, like, three months ago. And I know that, like, they were like, okay, count down from five. And by, like, four, I was gone. I was out of there. Um, and then I was waking up in the recovery room. So it probably didn't work that fast. Um, and, of course, when it came to blood and uh, a whole bunch of, like, we just did not understand the same things we do about medicine now so it very well in my opinion could have been there are no records of this girl i'm gonna just say that flat out there are no records that this girl ever had surgery um i don't know that there are records in atchison of a girl named sally but there are very well might have i mean and sally i mean could be a nickname so we actually can't know for sure and, of course, like, also think of the fact that, like, nicknames are very weird sometimes. Like, some people have nicknames that don't make any sense. So, Sally could have been a nickname. Um, there are no records of this girl, however, who had appendicitis and was operated on and then died. Uh, especially not in the house. No girl um, who uh, named Sally has ever been to Dr. Fenny's home to be operated on or have any sort of appointment so that's something to take into account however as a vouch for you know ye olden days um i know from someone who has done a ton of research on um just in general town records and or in general of things that have happened or that are legend in a town it's it's a very hard to pinpoint and find certain things um it of course it depends on the town because yeah, some towns have better processes than others but I will say as and I have done you know I've taken a whole building in Hayes and and deconstructed you know, when it was built, talked about who's all occupied it, who's all owned it, 
um, and actually found some rather fascinating things. But that was a it was a grueling process. You have to get a lot of research uh, done. So as a vouch, it is hard to know for sure what happened, um, you know, because we're never going to know unless we were there. And of course, the Internet didn't exist. And and I am also someone who works in a medical field where I do have to document a lot of things. And a lot of times we say, like, if, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. And that's that's history as well. If, if it's not documented, no one can know whether or not it actually happened. So that's a vouch for that story maybe being true. It could be. Who knows? Um, obviously, like, if a doctor, you know, botched a surgery, maybe he doesn't want that on his records. Like, if you simply do not document it, it just doesn't exist. No one can prove anything, especially in that time period. So, um, there's that story. That's, you know, the, the story of Sally. Uh, there's also another story for Sally, which is kind of the same, but it's also in that Sally is not just a random woman and her daughter who came to Dr. Finney. It is also um, that Sally is actually Dr. Finney's illegitimate daughter of a slave. And um, so in, in my opinion, with that thought, you know, he wouldn't document that his illegitimate daughter and her mother came to him and, you know, the surgery was botched and all of that. So, I can, I can say, like, maybe, maybe the story isn't real. Maybe it was completely fabricated. Or, I, you know, maybe we just don't have the records for it. It's absolutely possible. So, that's part of the Sally House. Um, as I said earlier, it, it, you know, some people do think this is a place occupied by a demonic spirit. We're going to talk about that a little bit, <clears throat> Ryan. Uh, so, a few other legends and stories that are connected to the home. Um, so, the eldest Finney, Charles uh, Finney's father, did actually pass away in the house. Um, and it's also been reported that there was a woman named Joanna, and she lived in the brother's house next door. Um, it wasn't exactly made clear in the story why this was. All they said about this woman was that she had been put into a, um, you know, a psychiatric facility and that she was, you know, insane and, and everything, but she was pregnant. So when she had the baby, they, you know, sent her off with her other son to um, go live in this house, but they didn't say specifically why it was uh, Charles Finney's brother. Um, house that they lived in. I hope that made sense. I'm rambling. Um, anyway, so, uh, basically, this woman, obviously, she was in a psychiatric hospital, and obviously, there were some things going on with her, um, you know, the, it's not a great time period for mental health, so, um, she did try to commit suicide using, um, gas in the basement, and um, her and her six-year-old son uh, to try and kill both of them. Her, she survived, um, but her six-year-old son uh, did pass away. So that could be another uh, spirit haunting the Sally house. Um, there are also several families who have experienced paranormal activity in the house. Uh, however, the last family that lives there, the um, Pickman family uh, have probably experienced the most activity, according to, uh, them, so, hold on, okay, I had to make sure my computer was still recording me, uh, because it just went dark, anyway, so they, they think a lot of the activity, you know, they've seen most of the activity, so, uh, Tony and Debbie Pickman, they moved into the home, and um, they moved in December of 1992. Debbie was pregnant with their first son, and they were very excited, thinking that they this house was going to become their family home. Um, however, apparently, uh, after a month 
uh, the activity sort of began, but it started out rather mild. Um, and then Debbie gave birth to their first son, and the activity seemed to pick up. There was um, a couple of things to mention, like the neighbor had noted to the couple, like they asked why they keep their nursery light on all night, and Debbie said, no, we don't do that. In fact, um, I remember in the episode of uh, Supernatural, or Unsolved Supernatural, uh, Ryan had specifically said that Debbie had said that the their son was actually now sleeping in their room. And, and, and so the room where the nursery was, there was no reason to have that light on at all, because not even the baby was in there. Um, and so she had asked the neighbor if it was maybe the hallway light, and the neighbor was absolutely certain it was the nursery light, and that it was on all night. So, that's interesting. Uh, and then, let's see. So, there was a strange mold that, uh, began to form on various household items. Uh, I couldn't really find a lot more, uh, information about that. Uh, so toys were moved and arranged on their own. Uh, Tony reports that there was a night that they actually tried to leave to go stay with family because they were so scared of what was going on that, um, uh, but as they were trying to leave, he was attacked and scratched uh, by, and had three mysterious scratches down his back. I don't know if there are pictures of this. There might be. I mean, it was 1992. Polaroids existed at the very least. Um, I'm not sure how much evidence there is of that. And that's not to say I don't believe in this, because as I said before, I do absolutely believe that spirits could exist. Um, but yeah, maybe, I don't know. We'll see, you know, uh, I, I, I would have to do a little more research. And, and, and these kinds of things are very difficult to research sometimes. Um, so, uh, then, so they hired a medium not long after that named Barbara Connors. Um, and they, she told the family that the home was inhabited by a little girl named Sally, which is where they get the name. Um, however, attacks continued, and the family began to believe that Sally was not a ghost of a cute little girl, but was rather a demon parading as one. Which, you know, um, there are other demonic reports. This actually comes from BuzzFeed Unsolved. Thank you, Ryan and Shane. Um, that, uh, demons do this. They, they take the form of children, because it's more, it's more of a trusting form. So, very interesting. Um... So, the Pikmin family, they moved out only after living there for two years. Um, it's, it's unoccupied. Uh, it's open to self-tours and overnight stays. The Sally House has appeared on um, many sighting and ghost hunting shows. And like I said, including, you know, Ghost Adventures is on there, but also BuzzFeed Unsolved, which is my personal favorite. Like, I absolutely love them. I, I, I cannot recommend them enough. They are hilarious, and they really take the whole ghost hunting thing. They have a good, I feel like there's a good, healthy, um, respect, but also a healthy, just kind of response to it, especially from Shane. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, the next story that I have is one I, I thought was interesting when I looked into it, because I've heard this story before, which, I mean, I'm not even... Hold on, I have to think of this. I might have to not talk about some stories. Um, or very quickly talk about some stories that are shorter. So, yeah. I have two more, two more kind of long ones. And then uh, I can, the shorter ones I can kind of lump. And then I have one more after that. Okay, here we go. Uh, so, I graduated from Fort Hayes State University with my master's. So I lived in Hayes for a little bit. Um, and this story is one that a lot of people who are native to Hayes and also go to the university will probably know, but it is the story of Elizabeth Polly, Elizabeth Polly, or the Blue Light Lady. So, um, the town, Fort Hayes, uh, it 
It was established on October 11th, 1865 as a frontier military road. Ah, yeah, as a frontier military road. Um, I don't know what I wrote here. As a frontier, I, okay. Basically, <laughs> to sum up my <laughs> writing, um, the the town was used, uh, the military there protected the, the roads, uh, defended construction gangs on the Union Pacific Railroad, and would guard the, the U.S. mail as it came through. This is a very basic idea. Okay, so here's the, the story of Elizabeth Polly. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 1867, a cholera epidemic hit Fort Hayes, and a young woman named Elizabeth Polly was among those who tended to and comforted the ill and dying. It is unclear whether she was just a good Samaritan or a trained nurse um, when she was... Taking a break, she enjoyed strolling along the nearby Sentinel Hill. Eventually, she also contracted cholera herself, um, which again, as stated, medical stuff, not, not super, super well done at the time. So, unfortunately, that probably happened more often than you would think. Um... So, contracted cholera, um, apparently um, her dying wish was to be buried on the hill, the Sentinel Hill, which she loved to go for walks on. Um, the, she was given a full military funeral, but uh, could only be buried at the base of the hill, since the hill itself was made of bedrock, so they couldn't dig into it. Uh, there were limestone posts that had marked her grave, um, and they long since been stolen. Uh, it's reported that the thieves met uh, tragic fates in gunfights, carriage accidents, and train mishaps. So, fun times. Over the years, there have been uh, a couple of sightings of Elizabeth Polly, and she's now known as the Blue Light Lady because she was buried in a blue dress and a white bonnet, and often is known to have uh, a blue light kind of coming off of her um, when people spot her spirit. Uh, first sighting that was reported took place in 1917, uh, reported by a man named John Schmidt. Schmidt reportedly saw a woman dressed in blue walking across his farm towards Sentinel Hill. He followed the woman uh, to a shed, which uh, he thought he had seen her go into, but once he went into the shed himself, uh, she was completely gone. Nothing had been disturbed or messed with, so um, it was odd. It was like she disappeared into thin air. And then another story comes from the 1950s. A police officer um, believed that he had hit a woman uh, with his patrol car but when he got out to check there was no one there he says that the woman was wearing a blue dress and had on a white bonnet um it's been seen many you know the ghost has been seen many times by the hayes residents uh the town honors her memory as of hmm, i thought there oh okay in the 1960s my bad they moved her body to the summit of the hill in 1941 Oh, sorry. They moved... The, <laughs> I, I messed that up real bad. As they had moved her body to the summit of the hill in 1941, and in the 1960s, a marker was placed at her gravesite that reads, The Lonely Grave. So, I lived in Hayes for several years. I never went to go see this. Um, I should have. I, I definitely should have. And maybe I'll go back someday and do that, but... Uh, for now, I just have never seen it, and it's kind of sad. So, I have a couple of other little stories. Well, I have, um, we'll, we'll talk about this one real quick. So, this one is not necessarily a ghost story. I'm going to take another drink. Oh, God. Okay. This is not necessarily a ghost story. It's, it's more just kind of creepy, spooky type stuff. Um, it's 
kind of short. So uh, we'll get through this and then I will talk about some, do some short other ones. And yeah. So uh, this one, uh, uh, probably a lot of people have heard of. It's, you know, the, the Bloody Benders, which is about, um, you know, a serial killer family. So it's, it's a pretty interesting story as well, but it also is one of those that, like, it does have evidence to support it, but it also doesn't, I don't know, we don't know really what happened 100%. So, um, typically we think of serial killers as one person committing unusually gruesome murders, but um, about seven miles from Cherryville, Kansas, um, killing and torture is all a part of the family business. In 1871, the Bender family, John, his wife, son, and daughter Kate, um, moved into the area, and Kate would actually gain notoriety, 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 yep, there we go, as a healer and spiritualist. I saw this, and I, they didn't really, like, go into further explanation on it, so... Okay, um, and then the family, they work together to murder and rob unsuspecting travelers, unfortunately. So when people would travel um, along the main road, uh, they would stop at the Bender's home and pay for a meal, probably some supplies. Um, however, the Bender's had set up um, their house so that there was a canvas curtain, so pretty thick material, hanging uh, from in, in between, it would split the house, so it would divide it in two, and so they would be able to see whenever the unsuspecting victim would sit down at the table to eat. Uh, they could see his head very clearly. I say he. There could have been women. We don't know uh, 100%. Again, uh, this did not, like, mention women. It did mention a child, but uh, there most certainly could have been women. But, uh, so, uh, when they would come up behind, they would be able to see their head from where they sat down, and then they would come up behind the person from behind the canvas and, and beat them to death with a hammer, unfortunately. Um, and then when the, uh, they were finished, uh, the body would be dropped into the basement pit and then later buried in their orchard. Uh, so more and more travelers started to disappear. People started to grow suspicious. Uh, however, the family actually disappeared in the spring of 1873. So they moved in in 1871 and left in 1873. They were only there for two years, which is pretty sus for like a farming family. Um, and soon after the bodies were discovered by inquisitive neighbors. Uh, so nobody knows what happened to the benders like they don't know if they just left uh if they continued what they were doing um it, it's estimated that they killed about a dozen people for sure at least that we know of um and like i said including one child uh so yeah no one's quite sure what happened to them they kind of just disappeared uh it would be interesting to see if there's more research on that. I definitely would love to do an episode about serial killers in Kansas because it's, you know, Kansas is like, I feel like it's a state that gets like shoved to the side a lot. And there's actually a lot of really interesting history here. So, um, definitely something to look more into, but that's what I found pretty quickly. Um, bloody benders. Yeah. Pretty spooky. So there are a couple of hotels that I looked at. Uh, the Wolf Hotel in Ellenwood, Kansas, the Midland Railroad Hotel in Wilson, Kansas, and the Dodge City, uh, Santa Fe, uh, and Harvey House. It, it has a hotel name. I don't think that I wrote it down. My bad. But it's actually now the, the Depot Theater. I've been there personally, like, uh, I went to Fort Hayes, but before I went to Dodge City Community College, go Conks, and, um, absolutely, like, it was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I went to the, I've been to the Depot the other day to see a, a show I think I saw in 9 to 5, which was fantastic, they did such a good job, so, yeah, that was fun, anyway, so, 
like I said, the first one I, I sort of mentioned, the Wolf Hotel in Ellenwood, Kansas. Um, I'm not going to go entirely through the history. It's pretty easy to find. Um, you know, it was built as an addition to another hotel in the town, um, adding a bunch of rooms and um, other things like a new lobby, underground uh, stores, and a bank. Um, and then... Uh, the one thing I found pretty interesting about this was the fact that there was, like, an underground tunnel system. It ran for, like, two blocks of the city, which is pretty cool. But it also held, like, different stores and card rooms and gambling. And it was really cool, honestly. I thought that was awesome. I would love to go tour this place um, and see what it's like. So that would be fun. That's something to definitely put on the list of things to do in Kansas. Um... So, yeah, it, the hotel, nice rooms, fine dining. It's actually uh, it's still a working hotel today. You can go and stay there. They have lots of activities, including, like, a murder mystery dinner, Prohibition Era bar, um, the underground tunnel tours, and, of course, like, comedy shows. Psh, can't beat that. Love a little bit of comedy. So there's not much about, like, spookiness going on here. It's actually kind of funny because these, the three hotels actually have very similar kind of ghost stories to them in which there is always always a little girl which is insane because I feel like that's something that people see in hauntings a lot so kind of fascinating anyway so haunted by several spirits um in the tunnels uh is where most people have uh you know where they they see the spirits or everything the only specific ghost that I had found uh for this hotel was that there was an unnamed man and I don't know for sure if he was actually unnamed or the article just didn't name him um so being completely transparent about that um who uh he committed suicide in the dining room in 1927 so they know the exact day they probably do know the name but they didn't mention the name so so that's the wolf hotel I really think the underground tunnel system is super cool and I want to go see that so um, okay, so we have Wilson, Kansas, the Midland Railroad Hotel. Again, not a lot I could find um, about uh, spooky stories here. I, I know it's kind of marked as one of the more haunted places in Kansas, but uh, I didn't really find any huge details. Again, I could be wrong. This is a very quick overview. I'm actually like, I'm 56 minutes into recording this, and part of me is like, wow, this is longer, this is more than I thought um, I would get. So, I that's why I'm kind of going through this kind of quickly, but also I don't have a lot of information. So, if you I mean, honestly, if you have more information to add to this, I would love to hear it. I love learning new things. I love hearing about all this stuff. It is so fascinating to me. And if you have actual information that, you know, or source I could go to, I would love, love to hear it. So, um, so again, uh, this hotel is built in 1899. It was the Power Hotel. Uh, and then it was gutted by a fire and later reopened as the Midland Railroad Hotel. Uh, there's not a lot to say. Um, on the third floor, a few people have talked about uh, a ghost. The ghost of a young girl, she runs up and down the hallway. And if she's feeling, quote, particularly, oh, sorry. If she's, quote, feeling playful, end quote. She will knock on doors or even jump on beds and leave footprints. Uh, other ghost stories include objects being turned on and off, doors slamming, and there is also one room, also on the third floor, which is, again, interesting, where uh, a sheriff was hanged, Sheriff Bart. Now, I don't particularly know who that person is in history. So, again, if anyone else does know and wants to say so... Please do. Um, uh, apparently that room that the sheriff was hanged in, and it is hanged, uh, it does not always open, even when the master key is used. So, uh, according to, like, many reviews of the hotel and articles, the hotel is uh, a nice little historical site to stay at. Uh, the food is excellent. 
might have to go check it out someday. So yeah, that's Wilson, uh, or the Midland Railroad Hotel. Again, it's something I, I just did not find a ton of interesting, like, stories on. Um, and, I, you know, maybe I will go deep dive into some of these a little deeper. Like, I'd really like to look more into the Bloody Benders. I'm sure there's more going on there. But a lot of these are just, it's, you know, it's spooky. It's old. Um, again, energies are, I feel like buildings keep hold of things. So, I don't know. I could be wrong. So here's my last one that I did research for. Um, so this is the Depot Theater in Dodge City. It was originally a Harvey House and the Santa Fe Depot. Uh, the When railroad traffic began to decline, um, the Harvey House was actually shuttered in 1948, which is sad because I love talking about Harvey Houses. I could go on for hours. Um, uh, through the building... Uh, sorry, the building continued to be used as railway offices. In July of 2004, after eight years of restoration, the Depot Theater was ready to go and still serves as Dodge City's dinner theater. So I, like I said, have been there. I have seen a show there, um, and it was fantastic, and they did a lovely job. So, good job. Uh... So, like, much of the other, like, haunted hotels and kind of old buildings, I really did not find a lot of specifics about uh, ghosts or spirits or anything. A um, few sightings of a little ghost girl uh, going up and down the stairs. Um, there's been a man seen in the basement. However, uh, there there's really nothing nefarious about a lot of these spirits. Um... You know, I I would, if I were a, a ghost and I could choose to linger in a theater for the rest of my life, totally would. So, I don't know. I honestly didn't find, I was really surprised that I didn't find more. Because I really, you know, think that Kansas is, I mean, and a lot of states have their own history like this and it's all so so fascinating and everything and it's all just these hidden little corners that we uh don't really think too hard about so i i really love seeing this stuff and finding it um so for the last thing as part of this episode of spooky kansas uh, another story that i had thought about and i did a little bit of kind of backtracking in my own life. So, my mom has told this story since I was a small baby. Not small baby, small child. And I was, in fact, a small child when this happened. Um, so, we lived in this home in Newton, Kansas. And um, my mom swears up and down this place is infested with not just ghosts, but poltergeists. Now, if you don't know what a poltergeist is, first of all, I have an excellent movie that you need to watch called Poltergeist. One of my uh, favorites, though I haven't watched it in quite a long time. I should, I should watch Poltergeist. I don't think it should make certain people watch Poltergeist, actually. Anyway, so, my mom believes this place was infested with poltergeists. A poltergeist is, a, you know, an elemental spirit um, that is usually, it usually takes the form of an animal. So, that's really all I know um, as far as that. I'm sure there's a deeper dive into it, but it's not necessarily a spirit connected to a person. Um, it's, it's a spirit, it's a nature spirit. It's, you know, something completely different. So... I was uh, about three years old when we lived in this house, and um, I, I have no memories, absolutely none. So, I do not, I, I, I'm not saying my mom's a liar, because she's absolutely, like, I trust her 100%, but I don't remember any of this, so I'm not speaking off memory, I'm speaking off my mom's memory. So, when I was a kid, um... We lived in this house, and we hadn't lived there very long, but apparently there was a basement, 
And sometimes my mom would find me down in the basement uh, looking up at a shelf, I believe, and my mom will probably correct me when she hears this, but that's okay, um, looking at a shelf and clapping at it and, and telling the monkeys to come and play. So my mom would come downstairs and find me just kind of like clapping and uh, motioning for something to come off the shelf and she would ask me what I was doing and I'd say you know I I want the monkeys to come and play with me because I was apparently seeing monkeys on that shelf fascinating um freaked my mom out of course because I mean okay children are creepy and I was a creepy child (laughs) um I also was a gross kid but that's a whole other thing um I was a creepy child but Like, this, I mean, it's weird, you know, it's an odd thing. So my mom kind of thought, imaginary friends, probably, you know. But then, like, some other things started to happen in the house. Um, I don't have a whole lot of the, uh, the background info here. I have no clue if anyone else has experienced these things in this house, um, besides my family. Um, there were four of us kids. My dad was a trucker, so he was out most of the time during the week he did not like he'd be home on the weekends um and everything so the only the other story I have is that um one day my mom had taken us kids out to do grocery shopping and and the like and my dad had come home from work and he decided to take a nap on the couch and again I may be telling this story completely wrong and I'm sure my mother will correct me but I'm absolutely telling it from what I remember (laughs) so uh my dad had fallen asleep on the couch and he was just passed out cold obviously like been you know working all week real tired and he so he you know wakes up and my mom is home and she's asking him like where the keys are um and my dad you know he came home tossed his keys on the coffee table and fell asleep on the couch so he's immediately like oh they're on the but they're not on the coffee table anymore they're gone so later um my parents as they're searching for these keys they apparently found the key ring but it was completely straight which like I don't know if you've ever tried to, like, undo a key ring or, like, in general, just put, like, a key on something using the key ring. Those motherfuckers are hard to to bend and to pull apart. So, like, completely straight. And then the keys were hidden all over the house. So, that's kind of all I have for that story but that's creepy right like my mom would not even stay on that house on halloween and you know my birthday would be when this comes out the day this comes out october 27th um and i you know my mom was like nope lease is up on halloween we're out i'm not staying here halloween night which you know who can blame her that is some creepy stuff so yeah i that's my fun little kansas spooky ghost story to add to this um I definitely want to take some time at some point to look more into the history of that house and see if there had been any, like, other sightings or anything like that. Just, you know, out of curiosity's sake. Um, But anyway, yeah, that is uh, the show, (laughs) essentially. So I I hope you enjoyed, like, listening. Um, I know I do a lot of stumbling and stuff, but this is all supposed to be kind of candid and just fun, relaxing me talking about these random things that I super enjoy talking about um, and researching and looking into. So if you did make it this far and you did listen, thank you so much. I super appreciate it. Um, You're awesome. And I would love to keep doing this and have a reason to keep doing this. So please, like, if you could somehow... Like, whatever platform you're listening through, um, I don't know what all this is going to go on to yet. I'll sort of figure that out as I go along. But whatever platform you're listening to this through, just, like, you know, let me know, like, do you want more? Are there topics, specific topics you think I should explore? I've got a whole list, but, like, I love getting suggestions. So, um, 
as for like where you can sort of find me at I don't just do this podcast I'm also working on a YouTube channel and I'm working on a Twitch um where I'm gonna be streaming some gaming stuff I'm a huge huge gamer um I love to play like cozy games but I'll play some adventure type stuff here and there so um I do have an a Twitter slash X account I'm just gonna call it Twitter uh you can find me on there as um Empress Faye Wild, I believe. Let me make sure that that is correct. Um, and I'll put I'll put links to all of these in the description so that they're easier to find. But for now, I'm gonna just say them. So, yes, okay. So you can find me at Empress Faye Fox, not Faye Wild, and Faye is spelled F A Y E. Uh, You can find me uh, under the same name on YouTube and on Twitch, Um, I believe. Uh, You'll, I mean, my little character that I have on the the title of this is going to be the same as, like, my icon that I'm going to use for everything. So, um, if you see that, that's me. Um, you can also find me on Instagram under Empress Faye Fox. And on uh, Facebook under the page uh, Empress Smallcraft. So uh, I all I don't just do like I said don't just do this. I do TikTok, which also Empress Faye Fox. Go check that out. I have a lot more on there. Um, but I don't just do this. I do cosplay. I do uh, the gaming videos, and I also um, make things. Sometimes I'm taking custom orders right now. I'm not because I want to take the time. We just moved, so I want to take the time to um, uh, get settled and and make some things for family and everything for Christmas. So that's uh, more what I'm focused on. Um, probably like January, February, or I'll state or I'll, eh, sorry, I'll start taking custom orders again. So um, this podcast it's not sponsored by anyone. Uh, but I would love it if you wanted to go check out my Patreon. I only have one tier. It's a $1 a month tier. Um, I do uh, appreciate it if you decide to give a dollar a month. Uh, you'll have my eternal gratitude. And on whatever episode is coming up next, I will, you know, give you a little shout out. Um, if you want me to shout out anything specific, please, like, leave a message uh, to do so. But my Patreon is, um, you know, under I am, I'm already looking it up, spelled just like the title. Um, so yeah, I, I, there's a lot of places you can find me. I've been doing the social media thing for just like a little bit, but it's never gotten anywhere. I just decided to try this for fun. This is more just me chilling, having a good time, talking to people, and just really exploring a lot of things I don't normally get to explore in my everyday life. So, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, I really do appreciate it. And um, I hope I can bring you more content. And I hope that you enjoyed listening to me ramble about spooky things. Thanks, guys. And I will, you know, see you next time.